Please welcome. Please welcome. Welcome. This is another episode of the Defenders of Business Value podcast, a podcast where we talk about what makes a business valuable, learn the tips and tactics to increase your company's value that only veteran dealmakers know. And now here's your host, Ed Misogland. Welcome to another episode of the Defenders of Business Value podcast. I'm your host, Ed Meisigland. And today it's that time of the year where the second quarter deal stats value index has rolled out. And so I wanted to have a shorter episode, but uh, share some of the, the meaningful information for those of you following business valuation. All right. So the first thing we, we want to draw your attention to is that EBITDA multiples um, seem to be returning to typical levels in 2024. Now, uh, EBITDA, for those of you new to the business valuation community, EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So, so what does it mean it's returning to typical levels? So at this time, um, over the period that was analyzed, uh, EBITDA multiples across all of the industries were the highest in the third quarter of 2018, and that was at a five, so 5x, and has since been trending downward um, until the second quarter of 2022. So clearly, COVID had uh, a, a, an effect on that. But since then, the EBITDA multiples have been generally trending upward, and now in the first, you know, Concluding the first quarter of 2024, we are at um, 4.3 as a median multiple. Okay, so that's EBITDA multiples. How about net sales? Same kind of thing. So in the quarters that were anal analyzed during this report, uh, the net sales uh, multiple of 54% of the first quarter of 2024 uh, was unchanged from the prior quarter. Um, and since that second quarter of 2020, net sales multiples generally have been increasing um, according to the three-quarter trailing average. This kind of contrasts with the previous declining trend from the second quarter of 2018 to the second quarter of 2020. The lowest multiple uh, recorded since the second quarter of 2018 was 43% of revenue, and that was in the second quarter of 2020. So, as far as net sales, you know you're you're running roughly at you know between 50 and 54% of revenue. Margins. The margins are are really interesting because um, they always tend to be between. 11 and 15 percent and and this is no different so the ebitda margins declined the first quarter of 2022 but have since trended positively reaching 15 percent in the first quarter of 2024. now ebitda margins were at their highest point in 2023 at, at 18 percent um and between you and me i'm i've I 18% is a, is a big number for EBITDA. Um, very few companies that we're seeing selling are running at that. Maybe at SDE, sell, that means seller's discretionary earnings, but not often do you see a, a you know an 18% uh, EBITDA margin. Normally it's between the 10 and 15%. So so, and that's where I want to go. The previous range was between 11 and 15% in the first quarter of 2019 through the first quarter of 2021. Since the second quarter of 2018, the EBITDA margins have never been below 11%, which is good. Um, and again, as the businesses um, recovered from COVID, they should be, their EBITDA margins should be improving. All right, let's talk about sectors. Um, it, it's really interesting. So the all-time EBITDA multiples remain the highest for the information sector. And between you and me, I, th I think this is a little bit misleading because normally there's not a whole lot of depreciation or amortization in the information sector. So that multiple, in this case, 11X, that jumps to nearly 18, is a real real big jump and uh, again i think it's i think it's somewhat 
misleading, but um, it, for true EBITDA, but for true EBITDA in a, in a information sector business, um, you know that number. That number does make sense, but normally we see those kind of multiples with public companies. All right. So again, we jump from 11 to, to uh, 18. Um, the utility sector uh, is at 8.2. Let me see what other big jumps we have. Meanwhile, the, the low um, tends to be in accommodation and food service. So the hospitality industry is at a 2x, um, but the median across all industries is still running roughly between 4.1 and 4.3. Okay. The EBITDA multiples for private and public sector transactions. So meaning private buyer buying public seller, the multiples are, are have decreased. So the EBITDA multiples for private buyer transactions, which involves a public seller, have decreased from 13.2x to 8.8. Now, and and to be honest with you, I I have no idea why that is the case. My I suspect um it's it has more to do with urgency of sale as opposed and and raising capital than it is than it is any anything else. So net sales multiples have declined, you know, um most notably, all right. So transactions across all buyer types um, have have seen a notable decrease, which and which it kind of conflicts with the EBITDA multiple is is trending upward. So the the decrease in the net sales multiple in 2023 compared to 2022, with exception of private buyer buying private seller, which had a modest two percent increase. You know the, you know it tends to be um, the multiples for the private buyer transaction involving a public seller had the, the largest decrease in um, in declining from two point oh three to one point four five x of and again this is this is revenue, um it, and it's really interesting again you most <clears throat> so and and when I'm talking about this this these sales multiples I'm talking. You know, private buyer buying public sellers, public buyers buying private sellers, public buyers buying public sellers, and then private buyers buying private sellers. Those are the what we're what we're looking at. It it just it just differs, but it, the and I, and I'll have links to this to these graphs in in the show notes. But you can see that everything is trending downward as far as as a, using sales as the proxy for value. All right, pricing multiples and profit margins are you know somewhat you know positive. I mean, the seller discussion earnings multiples were positive in 2024 for the companies up to a million in sales, um, uh, as well as those between one and five million. The EBITDA multiples have increased for companies in size ranges, except for the smaller companies, uh, up to 1 million in sales. And then lastly, the profit margins for companies across all sizes um, have generally been decreasing in 2024. Uh, I can tell you, I have not seen that, um, but where we're based out of Indiana, um, that's not totally atypical. It takes, seems as though it some things that happen on the coast takes a little bit of time to trickle to us. So, all right, let me see what else I can share with you. The 10 year trend for private sellers. All right, so the net sales multiple decreased nine out of the 15 sectors in 2023. The sectors that saw a significant decrease in, in net sales was information and finance. But like I said a minute ago, the EBITDA multiples were trending upward. So where I'm heading with this is that the these this data seems to be contradicting itself. I I I tend to focus more on if I could if I could focus on revenue, a revenue multiple tends to be uh, a better proxy for value. And I say that, and let me just give you an example. Like, for example, we 
valuing hospitality companies for sale. You know how they choose to report income and and uh, uh, and operating expenses and who all's on the payroll. You know it 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 varies across the board. The biggest thing for us, what tends to always be the case, is that the revenue happens to always be. No one understates revenue. Lots of people understate profitability. So that's why we tend to focus on the on the revenue. But again, and this is always the case, revenue, revenue may get you the, the value, but you need earnings in order to pay for it. And if you don't have the earnings, um, chances are it, it, the business won't be sold or you're going to have to structure it in a manner to to offset some of the um, shortcomings of the earnings. All right, so back to our 10-year trend. So the, the seller's discretionary earnings multiples have increased in seven of the 15 sectors in 2023. And those, again, the SDE multiple, um, you know, jumped uh, roughly 22% from 23 to this most recent quarter. The EBITDA multiples have been trending positively across most sectors. But again, there if you look at them as a whole, there's not a whole lot of volatility as you as you examine all, you know, all industries. They just it it there's just not as much volatility as one might think. All right. So as we and again, I will share these these multiples um and some of these graphs that i'm working from um so the last thing i wanted to share with you is the discounts um so the second half of 23 showed typical discount levels and what that means is, you know, throughout the process, I mean, you put, you have a bid and ask price. So that through the negotiation process between buyers and sellers, in which both asking prices and sale prices continue to fluctuate, there normally is a little bit of a delta between ask, bid and ask price. Um, so what the seller is likely to sell has been effectu- effectively been different than the original asking price. And it normally is. Um, and this has to do with the economy as well as buyer's assessment of financial conditions, industry comparables, return on investment, and the goodwill worth of the business as a going concern. So the largest discount recorded was the second half of 2017 to the first half of 2023, which was 23% discount. And that has, you know, again, being in the deal industry, and knowing some of the people, some of the players out there, uh, the lack of understanding valuation and how a buyer sees it is probably the best way to say it. Is that, you know, if you have a five million dollar business, but the earnings only support three, yet you put it out, you put you put it out for five million dollars, and you sell it for three, well, that's a you know that's a forty percent discount. So, at any rate, the typical discounts range between 16 and 18 percent right and the most recent discount was in the second half of 23 which was about 10 percent so so where i'm heading with this is and by the way there there's other services i'm using deal stats right now but there's other services like biz by sell i mean they tend to they and i don't know if i believe it or not but it it's it's really interesting because it seems as though uh, we're talking you know, between five, maybe we might get close to 10, but normally it's around 5% bid to ask. I don't know whether that's true or not. Um, I can tell you like with our practice, I mean, we try to be within that 10% range. Um, and most of the time we are. All right. So next, so everybody wants to know how long does it take to sell a business? Um, so the second half of 23, you know, we're still looking at 211 days. Um, and the second half of uh, two, 2020, which is no surprise, I, it took almost a year. So if I'm a business seller, I'm considering, 
you know, what am I going to do for, in this case, for the, um, how do I plan? Well, it's going to take, look, it's going to take you roughly, you know, six months to a year to make the decision that you're going to sell the business. It just, it just is that, I mean, the sales cycle is super long. And once you get all your ducks in a row, again, you're looking at six months to a year, you're looking at nine months to a year to sell. So now you're at between a year and a half and two years, and then you're going to have a transition period afterwards. And that transition period may be a month and it may be a year or You may even say, you know what, I want to stick with the business. And there's lots of seller or there's a lot, there's lots of SBA financing opportunities that will permit you if you're so inclined to remain with the business post sale. But again, if I'm a seller right now, considering the sale process, you're, you probably need to start best case scenario. You're a year and a half. Worst case scenario, you're probably closer to three years. Okay. Um, everybody wants to talk about officers' compensation. Um, I'll include I'll include this as far as you know where w- what's the number. Um, I can tell you that. Um, what's the best way to say this? That the officers' comp tends to be. Five to seven percent of revenue, the way it seems. I'll include this in the um, show notes. Um, the reason, the reason people want to know the officer's compensation and business valuation is again, you know, when you buy a company, you're looking at how much can I pay myself, how much debt can I service, and how much of a return of and all my investment can I get. That, th- those are the three ingredients. And so, what does that mean? Um, the reason we share officers' compensation data was so you can see, you know, what is what what is reasonable in your type of industry, and and again, if you're you know you're looking at a company that has a half million dollars in in um, you know in adjusted cash flow or SDE, and you're sitting here saying, look, I need four hundred thousand dollars in order for this to make financial sense. Well. You know, there's nothing wrong with that, but you know, if the industry, the normal officer is paying themselves, pick the number, you know, two hundred thousand, and you're two hundred thousand over, well, your valuation because of the requirements you're putting on the cash flow will be will be decreased, and that create will create a problem for you. So that's why we include the officer's compensation, just so you can see as you're building your your models, whether you're on the sell side or buy side, you can see what's what's reasonable. Um, and from a valuation standpoint, we can figure out what's reasonable so we can adjust your cash flow and hopefully maximize the value because you you may you may be overpaying yourself. And we can show from an appraisal standpoint that this makes more sense, you know, if you're paying yourself two hundred thousand rather than four hundred thousand. And then uh, again, that that demonstrates to the buyer. And again, we're talking uh, norm- normally, like when you're do, and the reason we do this it has more to do with EBITDA multiples as opposed to seller's discretionary earnings. With seller's discretionary earnings, we in, in incorporate all of that. Um, so we have, you know, a gross amount of cash flow, regardless of what the owner's paying, we want to take all of it and then we can, uh, adjust from there. Okay. So where are we? So we are, um, this was deal stats, this first quarter data. It's, um, it's always really helpful. Um, most of the people, you know, the, the, most of the, the people that, uh, are listening, you know, I get the most feedback on, on these types of episodes. Um, if you are, if you need market data, if you want to talk shop about, you know, what's going on in the industry, the door is always open. I'm, I get calls each and every week from somebody that just wants to just shoot the breeze about what's going on in their industry, what's going on with the multiples. And again, I'm happy to share. I'm, uh, I've been in practice for 32 years and sharing um, information that I have to help you has never gone wrong. So uh, 
reach out. My uh, contact information is in the show notes, and we look forward to talking to you next week. This was another episode of the Defenders of Business Value podcast. For more episodes packed with strategies to increase the value of your business, visit DefendersOfBusinessValue.com for show notes, transcripts, and free tools to start you on your journey. Subscribe now so you don't miss any future episodes.